all right. Friends from the industry, friends of the industry, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. As the Education Officer of the Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers, Hong Kong branch, it's my utmost pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar today. The response has been truly overwhelming as we have nearly 450 registrations and touching close to 200 with us from this moment. People are just dropping in all the time. Uh, launched by the Oil Companies International Maritime Forum, OCIMF, in 1993, the Ship Inspection Report Program, SIRE, is a safety initiative with the aim of ensuring that standards expected by oil majors are maintained in the shipping industry. Since its conception, the program has been based upon a standardization, standardized inspection questionnaire and is considered to have been an effective driver in improving safety management on tankers. At the same time, and in 30 years time in fact, based on the feedback from the industry, especially in view of the multifold technological improvements and the growing recognition of the human element, OKIMF has now developed SIRE 2.0, where performance influencing factors affecting human response and errors have been a focal point. There have been several other changes obviously generating equal amounts of interest and controversy. To answer the question whether SIRE 2.0 will actually be a game changer for tanker safety and be a beacon for the rest of the industry, ICS Hong Kong has brought together a glittering array of hands-on practitioners from the industry representing all sides of the table. To steer the event today, I would like to introduce the moderator, Captain Sanjeev Verma. Sanjeev is a master mariner with 27 years of experience in the industry, the last 13 years being in different shore-based roles. From being a risk assessor for oil majors and for CDI, heading the safety and quality department of a leading ship owner in Hong Kong, and now managing a fleet of VLCCs for a ship owner right from initial setting up of their in-house ship management division in Hong Kong. Sanjeev completed his MBA in the prestigious HKUST School of Business. He's an active member of the Nautical Institute Hong Kong Branch Executive Committee, ICS Hong Kong Chapter Executive Committee, various subcommittees of the HKSOA, regional subcommittees of DNB, CCF, LR, and ABS, and various other committees at Intertanko. Sanjeev, the floor is all yours. Or as they say, the captain has the con. Thank you, Sarad. Uh, uh, thanks very much for the in initial introductions and uh, uh, welcome you all, uh, all the participants from across the world. Uh, as I was going through, uh, the registration has happened all the way from US to Japan. Uh, SIRE 2.0, uh, I think most of the tanker crew are familiar with this OCIMF SIRE program regime. This is first launched in 1993. I mean, till date, uh, over 180,000 inspection reports are lying in the uh, system, uh, which has been helping the various stakeholders to vet the vessel's quality and the safety standards. From 1997, when the Uniform Vessel Inspection has been launched, there have been seven revisions. And, uh, but in spite of all those seven revisions, actually in the last uh, 30 years, uh, we still do see that in incidents still do occur. And uh, I mean, all of us, we know that majority of these incidents are, uh, which are compromising the maze time safety can be attributed to the, some poor judgment, lack of common sense and critical thinking, miscommunications, shipping knowledge, lack, and the role of the human factor is very critical in the maritime time industry. The majority of the questions in the existing vessels uh, questionnaire system uh, is, is revolving around like, you know, in uh, procedures, hardware, management systems, and uh, not necessarily these underlying causes of the incidents which are happening, which is based on the human factor are, are, are being uh, like, you know, brought forward, whether it's a human action or inaction, you know. So somehow, uh, I mean, the, the industry and, and the stakeholders in the industry has, has seen that the system has plateaued and there was a need to overhaul the program and to take a risk-based approach and provide a kind of a, a system 
where uh, a better judgment can be taken on the quality or the likely future performance of the vessels. So, and that's how uh, the SAI 2.0 uh, has come into the play, which ensures the risk-based focus on the human factor along with the data-driven model for improving the maritime safety uh, across the industry. Now, vessel owners, operators, managers, seafarers, they all should be prepared for this new inspection regime and uh, engage with this SAI 2.0 familiarization and industry engagement program. We are delighted to welcome you all to join and listen to our experts and the panelists in this webinar organized by the Hong Kong branch of the Institute of Charters and Brokers. And uh, let me introduce you to the speakers and panelists for today's panel discussion. I'll start with uh, uh, Duncan Elson. Uh, he's the technical project manager, vessel inspection program projects at OCIMF. Duncan served 30 years at sea on board tankers, the final seven years as a master with the Chevron shipping company. In the seven years in the Chevron London Marine Assurance team, his activities included conducting over 100 TMSA DOC holders audits, is maintaining his accreditation for oil, chemical, and gas, supporting the local and regional emergency response team at Chevron. Also, he's representing Chevron as OCIMF in the SIR focus group as part of the VIP inspection work group and VIP governance work group. In the last three years at the OCIMF as a technical project manager for VIP project, which is best project, with the responsibility of coordinating and development of SIR 2.0 question library, SIR 2.0 inspection editor, and SIR 2.0 inspection process instruction and guidance documents. And nobody else can be better than Duncan to be on this uh, panel. Thank you so much, Duncan. Welcome you. Thank you. Our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Captain Rachid Jan, uh, Managing Director for Safely in Singapore. Uh, Rachid has been well known in this part of the world. Uh, he's an entrepreneur and maritime professionals for more than 25 years of experience working with oil majors and management companies, including BP, ExxonMobil, OSM Tanker, and Buxaw. Rashid presently heads a leading maritime consultancy firm providing an ecosystem of solutions, services, and training. With worldwide presence, the firm offers consultancy for effective and sustainable management of maritime assets, terminals, and offshore operations. As a master mariner, Rashid expertise in safety management system, TMSA audits, and training, including the human factor training. So, Rashid, welcome to the webinar. Our, our third speaker, Captain Harmeet Bhatia, uh, Managing Director for Headmar Singapore. Uh, Harmeet has an extensive experience of over 25 years in oil and chemical tankers industry. He served as a captain and varied in onshore roles, but not limited to the bunker trading, vessel chartering, and operations. Having accomplished an exciting journey with Headmar, Far East Limited over 15 years, Harmeet is now the Managing Director and continues to progress with the evolving challenges in his quest to excellence and perform in the oil and chemical tank in this industry. You are the right guy on behalf of Charters to be on this panel. Welcome. And uh, last, last but not the least, uh, our final panelist is a very unique person, Captain Shiraz Mogul, uh, Senior Marine Superintendent with the China LNG Shipping International Company Limited, Hong Kong. Siraz has been a 43-year veteran in maritime industry, starting his career in 1980s, uh, selling all across the various kind of tankers, from product tankers to the VLCCs. Uh, came ashore in 2007 after 27 years of sea seaboard experience and based in Hong Kong. He has been accredited OCMF SIR Category 1 Inspector for Oil, Chemical and Gas, carried out close to 950 inspections of these type of vessels under the current SIR regime. He's also worked with the leading maritime consultancy company, London Offshore in Hong Kong until 2021. And recently he joined a leading LNG ship operators in Hong Kong, China LNG, as a senior marine superintendent. During this time of consultancy, he has carried out numerous training workshops for the tanker operators on the current SIR program, as well as soon to be implemented SIR 2.0 program. And now, Shira is in a unique position of being able to speak on this topic both from the viewpoint of being as a SIR inspector, as well as from the perspective of the vessel operator. So this is uh, like, you know, Siraj, you are, you, are the, you are the best person joining two hats and being on this webinar. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thanks. Looking forward to it. 
Yeah. So before we start the webinar, a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. Actually, uh, uh, I just request all the audience uh, to keep your microphone on mute uh, uh, unless you are speaking. And uh, you can use the Q&A chat box for putting all your questions. Uh, we will have about 15 minutes, uh, final 15 minutes for the Q&A session. So we'll pick up the questions from there and put forward to our speakers. <laughs> and, uh, before we uh, start the proceeding, uh, uh, I would like to request Duncan to give us a short presentation about the OCMF SI 2.0 program and then we move on to our discussions in the webinar. Duncan, all yours. Okay, thank you very much. So I will share my screen. Uh, please confirm that you can see it and then I will carry on. Okay, got it? Yep. Okay, <clears throat> so obviously I've only got 15 minutes to, to talk about site too, and it's, it's an immense subject with many, many facets uh, of, of interest. Uh, so I can only give you a brief overview um, obviously, whoops, just got to make the screen change. Okay, so there we go. Um, so obviously, um, this is a, a new sort of program to being developed by Ockham, and it's based on Ockham's vision, mission, and strategic priorities. And of course, the vision of, of Ockham is to be a global marine industry that causes no harm to people or their environment. So um, essentially, I will leave, leave you to read the mission because it's rather a long one, but we have four strategic priorities, which is publications, advocacy, programs, uh, and members collaboration. And that's what drives everything at Ockham. So moving on, uh, Ockham recognizes that we have to manage the changing risks within industry. And as the industry risk profile continues to change, Ockham recognizes the need to focus effort and resources on areas of greatest risk to members, recalibrate organizational structure to deliver greater value, and utilize new technologies and ways of collaborating to, to enhance efficiencies. So essentially, when it applies to SI2, VIQ7 and, and its predecessors were an excellent tool for many years, but they kind of reached the end of life cycle and it's time to, to reinvigorate the process to, to take into account everything that's gone on within our industry. So why SIA uh, too? Um, obviously the most important point that's been on the minds of many people for many years is the integration of human factors. The second point is increased focus on significant risks. Obviously we can spend eight hours on the ship looking at things that don't matter, or we can spend eight hours on a ship looking at the things that matter. There is a balance of the two, um, but obviously with the old SIA system, there was hundreds of questions and inspectors asked them inconsistently and often focused on things of their interest and their knowledge rather than specifically on the things that were most important to safe operations of ships. That's no criticism of inspectors. It's a difficult, it's a difficult job. Um, they all did, they're all doing their best, but we needed a, a way of focusing the inspector's time on the things that matter most to evaluating the performance of ships and their operations. Now, over recent years, there's been some doubt cast upon some aspects of the SIA program, the behaviours of inspectors, submitting companies and vessel operators, and what we call gaming the system and inspector shopping and numerous other types of behaviours that are undesirable have been seen to be uh, anecdotally going on. And of course, SIA 2 was a perfect opportunity to develop a system that couldn't prevent people from doing these things, but would give us many indicators of what they were doing and would allow data mining to identify uh, people and organisations that weren't uh, using the SIA system as it's designed. SIA 2 obviously was also an opportunity to reinvigorate the question set and at the same time to link uh, TMSA KPIs where they were relevant to shipboard inspection activities. As the previous system, the regulatory sort of environment changes over time and it's never static. So we needed a better system of being able to update the, uh, the question set. Now, this is more of an internal thing than an external facing thing. 
but we've created databases that will allow us to much more easily identify questions that uh, need to be updated based on changes in regulations, best practices, and industry guidance. SIA2 also is leveraging technology in the use of uh, a tablet uh, for the use of the inspector, inspector during inspections. Um, this allows us to in, in change from a static question set to a dynamic question set uh, where we ask uh, fewer questions, but in more depth, but obviously they're changing in the background and without uh, some kind of uh, technology to assist the inspector, it become quite difficult to do that. And the, uh, the, the tablet provides the perfect platform to allow the inspector to understand and use the uh, CBIC during uh, an inspection. And of course, uh, it was also an opportunity to align with Occam's new vision and strategy uh, around risk management and risk focus. So uh, Occam has guiding principles on human factors. Um, and in principle, it's recognized that people will mistake, make mistakes. They make mistakes at every level in every walk of life. You know, it's a human attribute to make mistakes. People's actions are rarely malicious, and usually make sense to them at the time. So just because somebody makes a mistake doesn't mean they're doing it deliberately. Uh, it's because simply their training and what they see around them at the time, they feel that's the right thing to do. And, and you know, that often leads to mistakes. Mistakes, uh, mistakes are typically due to conditions and systems which make work difficult. If a procedure, for example, isn't clear, then people will often do the work uh, not in compliance with the procedure as written or as understood by the vessel operator, because in the end, the people who read it didn't understand it in the same way as the people that wrote it. We need to understand the conditions in which, make, uh, in which mistakes happen to help us prevent and correct them. People know the most about their work and are key to any solution. And this is a really critical point for SIA2 because the inspector will be interviewing the officers and the crew on board a ship because they're the experts in the work that is done on a day-to-day -day basis. So it will be the meeting of two experts to discuss the work being carried out. We need to recognize that plant tools and activities can be designed to reduce mistakes and manage risk better. So whilst the people on board the ship cannot change the design of things in many cases, they can at least recognize poor design and therefore develop procedures to, to, to mitigate the risk of, of any poor design of a ship. And obviously in the future, the, the design of ships and equipment can improve based on, on their learnings. Leaders help shape the conditions that influence what people do. And it matters how leaders respond when things go wrong. They should take the opportunity to learn and to develop systems and procedures to prevent something happening in the future. They shouldn't simply blame the people that made the mistake. They should understand the reasons why that person made a mistake and then make sure that uh, as far as possible, those reasons are mitigated and communicated across their fleet and the industry where necessary to try and avoid the same things happening elsewhere. Okay, so the, the way that an inspection is done is, is being redesigned from the bottom up. So uh, Ockhimf um, developed a new question library uh, and then set around uh, risk assessing the questions based on uh, bow ties that have been developed by the members. And very simply, we have a question library with several hundred questions in it, some of which are core, which are considered that uh, they must be arms asked on every occasion, on every inspection, that they're applicable to that type of ship. And these inspection questions are usually focused on preventing or mitigating risks that could directly lead to a catastrophic risk event. There is also some core questions that are included that are necessary to make the mechanics of an inspection function. The vast majority of questions in the question library are rotational. And these are questions focused on preventing mitigating risks that could indirectly lead to a catastrophic event or directly lead to a lower low risk event. Now, 
when it comes to deciding which questions go to which ship and how, we have to have quite a, a lot of sets of rules around these questions. I mean, obviously, it's based on if it's a gas tanker, we send it gas tanker questions. If it's an oil tanker, we send it oil tanker questions. But that's quite simple. Um, but we also have many other conditions against questions that are derived from vessel specific uh, information and the ship's type. Uh, and, and often this information is being provided by the vessel operator through each, either the HVPQ or the pre-inspection questionnaire. And that allows the, the targeting and focusing of questions on the right ships. SI2 also allows for campaign questions, a little bit like port state control, where data tells us that there's a, there's a concern in a specific area. It will allow uh, the membership to um, assign specific questions that are actually rotational to the core status on a temporary basis uh, to make sure that they appear in every uh, inspection until that campaign is finished. And that will allow more data mining to understand the effectiveness of that question. Now, in some cases, uh, there may be the need for a new question to be uh, developed uh, as a campaign. It's a slightly longer process because obviously we have the three month notice to the industry to bring new questions in. Um, but because we developed the SIA question library on risk, it's unlikely that something's going to pop up in the short term um, that needs a new question for a campaign because essentially uh, virtually everything has been risk assessed and everything is covered that was does present uh, a risk within the within the uh, daily operations of a ship. Now, all of this, um, these questions are, are put into a pool, they're sorted and, and, and sliced and diced by a compiler and a unique uh, inspection is created for each inspection and it's then sent to the inspector's tablet. Uh, okay, so why do we use a tablet for the SIA 2 inspection? As I mentioned earlier, it's to help the inspector manage the vast amount of data that he needs to be aware of, or he or she needs to be aware of to conduct an inspection effectively. So when an inspection is booked and um, assigned to an inspector, certificates, photographs, and um, the pre-inspection inf questionnaire information is sent to the tablet uh, through and also the um, specific vessel inspection questionnaire called the CVIC is sent to the, um, to the tablet. Now, the inspection editor software allows the inspector to look at the questions that are appropriate uh, to each location on board the ship. So that helps him manage the data that's presented to him in a, in a ship spe uh, location specific way. Also available to the inspector is all of the guidance related to the CVIC question. So if he forgets or, you know, or needs to remind himself about uh, some aspect of a question or point out to a, a, a crew member which particular point he's raising or discussing, then all of that is available on the tablet and it's quickly, quickly referenced. One big change for SIA 2 is that the uh, observations from core questions that rate were raised in the previous inspection will be provided to the inspector as additional information to help him assess the same questions at his inspection. This is a you know a big deviation from the from the past. It doesn't mean to say the inspector is going to be going on board specifically to verify the effectiveness of the closeout by the vessel operator. But obviously, if the same kind of uh, indicators are still there, it's more likely to lead to the inspector raising a negative observation on, on the next inspection. So essentially, effective closeout is necessary uh, and is part of the process. Now, the tablet will also gather together all of the information necessary to provide a consistent and coherent inspection report on every occasion. Um, so 
it also gathers quite a great, uh, quite a, um, a selection of governance data about the inspection. So when the inspector boards the vessel, he will start the inspection on the tablet. It will record the exact time and GPS location that that inspection was started. When the inspector finishes the inspection at the top of the gangway, it will record the exact time and GPS location where the inspection was completed. So going forward, there will be no argument about how long an inspector spent on board. And uh, inspectors that claim they can do an inspection in four hours and uh, you know, pr provide a report, essentially, very quickly, it will be exposed that they weren't doing what they were asked to do. Hopefully, that will result in everybody coming into the uh, program expectations of doing the, the full inspection as required. Also, there will be supporting photographs that the inspector can take during the inspection, um, exported to be included in the report. So global tablet acceptance is a concern amongst some. Um, so, you know, people say, you know, terminals won't allow the tablets to be used and they object to the use of cameras. OK, so these are all valid concerns. So Ockimp has gone through a very thorough process to evaluate the tablet that they've uh, selected for SIA 2, which is an iSafe model 9301, uh, which is uh, certificated to the, um, the level that you can see on the screen. We went through ISGOT from cover to cover to pick out anything that was relevant to the use of electronic equipment in a, on a, in a dangerous area. And we verified that every aspect of ISGOT was met by the tablet um, that we'd selected. Now, obviously that talks about it from a safety perspective, but one of the major concerns for terminals particularly is the security aspect of taking a tablet into the, in, into the terminal and the use of the camera, because in some cases it's considered very sensitive what's, what's inside a terminal facility. So, Understanding and recognizing that, Ockim has developed a very um, strict set of rules for the use of the camera, which basically says you can't take any photographs of the uh, port or terminal facilities, except for in a couple of exceptions. But if a terminal still won't allow the use of a, of a camera while the uh, inspector's on board the ship, then uh, Ockim can um, disable the camera remotely um, using the mobile device management um, software. Um, and the camera is only ever accessible anyway through the inspection editor. There's no way that the inspector could use the uh, tablet to take photographs uh, it, in any other way than during an inspection, which will then uh, append these the photographs to the inspection and export them to OCIMF. They cannot be exported in any other way and used for any other purpose. To make sure that it's completely clear what the purpose of the tablet is, the inspectors have been issued letters which will explain uh, the background of the tablets to ports and terminals and the vessel's master. So that brings me to the end of my very brief um, presentation. And so I'll hand back to the Sanjeev, thank you. Thank you so much, Duncan. I think you have just set the platform on the right tone by giving us all the details about this program. And I think uh, there are many uh, seafarers, operators, ship owners, charters have uh, lots of questions about this program and why not they should have because there was a last SIAP 1.0 which ran for almost 25 years and everybody was particular thing and now we are talking about 2.0 so let me uh, start the uh, with the rest of the panel and of course with you and uh, I would like to start with uh, Captain Siraz uh, who has been very recently jumping sides from being as a science inspector to presenting the operator so uh, Siraz uh, let me ask that uh, uh, I mean uh, you have seen last so many years 950 inspections but then what do you see that like what, why there was a need for changing this uh, regime and uh, what was this present inspection regime was not effective and if if not then uh, why now because considering that we are still 
just opening up after uh, one of the longest, uh, uh, you know, lockdown in our memories in the last 50, 60 years or so. Um, thanks, Sanjeev. Um, well, if I look back at the inspections I've carried out, it primarily related to documents and hardware. In very few cases there the, the, was the question asked as to whether a person knew what the procedure was. Mm -hmm. um, it just asked whether there was a procedure. But I think what has happened over the years is that despite SIRE 1.0, as we are now fondly calling it, um, being in place for, as you said, 25 years, um, the number of incidents has gone down from before SIRE, obviously, but it has, as you said earlier, plateaued. There are still incidents taking place and investigations into incidents have revealed that despite there being procedures in place, despite their equipment being in good order, accidents are still taking place, which can only be then attributed to a failure on the human side. Now, these failures, when I use the word failure, I don't mean that someone is you know, too incompetent. Um, as Duncan pointed out, nobody goes and purposely makes a mistake. Uh, that's not the intention of anyone joining a, joining a ship, but human beings being human beings do make mistakes. Um, we inspectors are no different. We've made mistakes in our reports. Uh, so, you know, that's a human factor right there. But I think the new system focusing on human factors is something that the industry has needed to do for years. Um, it's been a long time coming and in my opinion, very, very overdue. Um, there are people who are concerned about how this is going to be dealt with by inspectors, but let me try and put their minds a bit at ease. All inspectors have been trained by OKIMF. OKIMF um, contracted with a human factor specialist organization who provided this training to us. And I was lucky in a way because I happened to leave um, or, or sort of sur surrender my accreditation after I had actually done the um, SAR 2.0 technical and non-technical training. Um, the only thing that was left for me to do was the SAR or the tablet um, assessment, which I didn't do because it happened after I came on board here. Um, but we have been taught or trained to identify um, the reasons why someone has not done something um, identify nervous traits, identify fatigue. I mean, identifying fatigue, if the guy's falling asleep when you're asking him a question, then it's obviously he's fatigued. Plus, how to identify certain symptoms. Now, obviously, we are not psychologists, and I do anticipate that at the beginning of the program, there are going to be some teething problems, um, some challenges coming up from operators where the inspector says that the guy was not familiar with the procedure because um, you have the performance in the influencing factors and he chooses nervousness or something similar. And the operator says, no, no, he wasn't nervous at all. He couldn't answer the question because he did not understand the question. Um, so that is going to happen. I, I do understand that operators, their job is to push back on observations. Um, but that being said, I think uh, the program is definitely going to be um, one that gives the operators as well, not just the oil majors. It gives the operators an opportunity to understand what their staff on board are doing and identify weaknesses, um, which we couldn't do in the previous SIA regime. So we identify weaknesses. If a guy is nervous, all right, we have to find ways of developing or you know, bringing up his levels of confidence. And that can only be really be done through training and proper familiarization. Um, that brings us to the question of the SMS. Some companies got SMSs where you need a separate uh, room on a ship to put the files. Some companies have got a very concise and to the point SMS. Um, so it's a question of the guy being able to familiarize himself with that SMS. No one expects the seafarer to memorize the entire thing, whether it's a small SMS or a large one, but he should at least be able to find the procedure relating to a particular thing. Um, and that is what we are trying to achieve here. Saying, right, we want to have seafarers on board who, will, who know what they're doing, and they also understand why they're doing it. 
Um, as for the question as why now at this stage after three years of lockdown, um, I, I would just say, what's the point of waiting any longer? The industry has waited long enough for something like this. Um, in the past, as an inspector, I've recognized that there are certain weaknesses in ship staff, but the program did not give me any space to record something like that. Some oil majors do have that, like BP has confidential comments. Um, so, you know, you could put it down there. But by and large, there was no space to put it into a regular SIA report, whereas now you can. And to put operators' minds a little more at ease, and if there are any seafarers watching this, um, there is also the scope of an inspector recording a positive observation where the person has performed above expectations. So there is going to be a balance in place. So, but coming back to that again, why now? Why not? I cannot disagree anymore, actually, because uh, I think the, everywhere the things are opening up, like, you know, and, and uh, obviously uh, there could be some lack, but uh, as you rightly said that, like, you know, if something has to be done, uh, uh, there's no right time, actually, you know, to just step up and uh, go, go for that change. Uh, Duncan, uh, like, you know, I mean, uh, we already had uh, seven versions of VIQ since 1997. So um, why why we are uh, not calling it eight or nine, and why we are calling it new side two point oh? Uh, in in terms of the question banks, uh, you know, in terms of uh, uh, the core questions actually, because more or less the questions are going to remain there as it was identified in the previous. Day. Uh, are we still uh, looking uh, a kind of an old wine in a new bottle, or is it completely a new uh, paradigm shift from the side one point oh to side two point oh? Okay, well, that's a really good question, and thank you very much. Um, so firstly, we need to dispel a few myths. SIA is an acronym for Ship Inspection and Reporting System. SIA 2 is a name. There is no such thing as SIA 1. It is, SIA is an acronym, the old system. SIA 2 is a name, and that will also include, eventually, uh, barges and offshore vessels. So that's why it's a name. So that's, we need to get that out of the way to start with. Now. Obviously, SIA 2 isn't simply an, a reiteration of VIQ 7 to 8 or 9. It's clearly not. It's a new inspection program that's been re redesigned from the bottom up. So you asked a good question, why now? Well, at the end of the day, I've, I've been working on this for four years with some of my colleagues, and we're getting towards the end. And in the end, when we finish and it's ready, we should deliver it because the, the industry has been waiting for it. Nobody could have predicted COVID uh, and we've worked all the way through it and we've been working with people continuously uh, to make sure that we get buy into the new system. Now, so what's different about uh, SIA 2.0 against VIQ7? Well, as I mentioned before, the inspector will be required to deal with less questions but with more depth, focusing on three aspects of the questions where they're applicable, hardware, process, and human. Now, human considerations are now reported on for the majority of questions, and as a result, greater understanding of the onboard and shore-based management of the vessel can be derived from a single report and from data mining reports across a managed fleet. The whole approach is a change from the inspectors trying to verify that a ship, its equipment and outfitting is in good working order, to verifying that the correct actions have been taken where equipment is out of um, service or defective. So realistically, you know, we've, we've taken the boot off one foot where the inspector goes hunting for things that are wrong to write down, to recognizing that ships nearly always have something wrong somewhere. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's simply a case of, has it been reported and is it being managed properly so that the right actions can be taken? The, the thing that makes a ship dangerous um, is when equipment is out of service and people aren't aware of it, so therefore the proper uh, mitigation is not put in place. And also people try to use equipment that's not functioning correctly in an inappropriate way. So realistically, it's a complete change in mindset. We expect the vessel operators to be almost desperate to tell us what is wrong with their, their ship and what they've done about it, rather than trying to hide it away and avoid getting uh, negative observations in that respect. So that's why 
this is a, a new system. It is a lot of the old paradigms are gone. It's not going to be business as usual. People need to change their attitudes. Vessel operators, inspectors, vessel staff, submitting companies, recipients. Everybody needs to think differently about SIA2 because we're providing a huge amount more information that will add value to their decisions and their processes. Thank you. Thank you, Dan Kun. I, I think uh, you precisely put down, it's, it's just like a, a shift in uh, the way in which we've been doing things in the last 25 years. And it's a need of time, actually, that, you know, that shift has to happen. Uh, obviously, uh, as we, it progresses out, we'll have to see a lot of uh, nitty and gritty will be there that will be definitely taken care of it. But then again, uh, it's, it's entirely new approach of looking at the whole thing, putting the human factor into that one. Um, so um, I would just like to bring Rachit over here and uh, Rachit, uh, as you can see that like, you know, now uh, you're moving into a, a new process completely and, and uh, from the existing process where uh, I mean, it has come down to a stage where the quantitative stuff has taken over the qualitative assessment. Originally, it was uh, it was not the case. Actually, it was meant for the qualitative assessment, but over a period of time, it has taken over. So uh, it's, it's a major shift, actually, that requires the mindset to be changed all party. Uh, how do you see that? Like, you know, how, in your view, industry is going to tackle this issue? And in, in particular, the operators and, and the guys who are sitting on this side of the fence. Yeah, th thanks, Sanjeev. Uh, as you rightly pointed out, you know, the, uh, initially when when SIRE program was rolled out, you know, the 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 focus was more on the on the uh, quality. But uh, over the period of time, uh, what happened was, you know, the shift went towards the uh, the quantity. Now, with my experience working uh, in an oil major company, I can share with confidence that uh, uh, wetting process. Uh, takes the risk-based approach uh, where the uh, quality <clears throat> of an inspection uh, takes precedence uh, over the quantity. Now, now you may exper uh, experience that an inspection with the five observations uh, has passed uh, uh, the wedding process, uh, whereas an inspection with one or two observation has been rejected. Yeah? So <clears throat> that is a, a very clear indication that number does not play uh, a critical role uh, in passing or failing an inspection. Yeah. So uh, currently, uh, we as in Tanker operator uh, focuses uh, on number of observations per inspection. We have seen that uh, uh, every now and then, you know, operators talking more on the uh, on on the on the number of observations. Every company has the KPIs uh, for uh, number of observations uh, per inspection. <clears throat> uh, we have even get uh, into the benchmarking uh, based on the numbers. Yeah, but we often miss uh, a look into the nature of observations. And this uh, probably is uh, one of the reasons why OCIMF has now stopped uh, publishing the benchmarking data. Yeah, because uh, industry average, when we talk about on the on the uh, number of observations, that has come down to below two. Uh, and uh, that is something which definitely is not coinciding with the with the incidents uh, which, which are happening. So, uh, the shift which we require is uh, to focus more on the on the quality observations, the the risk uh, which vessel impose from that particular obs uh, observation or or wetting. Uh, this is the intent uh, of uh, existing SIRE program, and uh, I uh, believe that uh, this would not change even uh, with the migration of SIRE 2.0. Yes, there will be more focus uh, as well and. Uh, uh, there will be uh, one new element which has come in, which is the human factor. But uh, when we talk about on the on on the mindset, you know, I think the the basic hasn't changed, be it uh, uh, sire or sire two point oh. Yeah, thanks, Rachit. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, the uh, the core of the whole thing, like you know, uh, about the safety of the ships, has not changed. It's just a different approach and putting the things together. Um, also, like, I mean, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, I mean, uh, uh, as we all know that, like, you know, SIRE regime is over and above the regulatory requirement. Uh, I mean, we do have a standard regulatory requirement uh, governed by the flag state and the classification societies. 
and and that's the uh, standards which each vessel has to follow but uh, of course uh, uh, on the tanker side and and now was driven on the dry bulk side and some of the other segments of the shipping uh, this has been taken as over and above requirement and the min mandatory requirement uh, i would like to ask uh, harmeet uh, who's been uh, uh, sitting down uh, and handling the ships on the charter side uh, hermit like you know uh, at times uh, i mean these uh, requirements of following of these requirements has become become an unsaid norm in the chartering industry and could be quite expensive at times for the operators so we all know that like you know as, as charter party requirements the uh, operator need to comply with these regular inspections under this regime so uh, why why do you think that like you know uh, the owners or the operators has to bear bear this cost why not it for this charter worthiness actually the compliance with the charter party why not we just simply call it like you know i'm just coming from the owner's perspective that like you know could it be not from the charter side because it is the one you are asking for this uh, compliance to the cp i mean it's a good question uh, obviously the whole success of uh, sire 2.0 or sire 2 bears in the it's it's dependent on all the stakeholders who are probably going to utilize the ships uh, for carriage of various cargoes and uh, then the stakeholders how soon they implement uh, the whole process that's a big question the cost factor probably is the last one to be addressed because right now everything the implementation is i think the burden is on the operators uh, how we going to how soon because when it is rolled out then obviously this is the regime right we have to all follow it once it's rolled out the cost implications will come at a later date now this is too early to figure it out right now we're still in the development stage how what will be the exact cost impact once that is calculated assessed then probably that's the next stage which will come obviously the burden alone won't come on the front line it will be shared equally right from the carrier to the charter to the retailer to the end user so it's a little bit premature to discuss exactly the cost consequences how they will be divided but that's probably the next step after the roll out implementation and successful uh, uh, regime basically successful standardized then probably that's the next stage of uh, conversation all right so you do see that there is uh, some scope actually for the owners to talk with the charters once the whole thing has been rolled out that's a good point actually because i think uh, there has to be some open discussion about it also uh, we're talking about uh, both from the seafarer's point of view as well as from the operator's point of view correct thanks thanks amit uh, so uh, duncan like you know, i mean, uh, I mean uh, uh, we we would like to uh, have your views on that one because uh, it is uh, it is 2.0 okay fine and you know that in the current segment the current regime uh, uh, we we are talking about the, the operator side uh, there is there's a there's a clear mandate of like having something called tmss which they have to comply with they have to make a declaration and then comply with it so uh, do you see that like 2.0 is been uh, incorporating those references to the tmsa and how will how good it will be for the operators point of view because at the end of the day tmsa is all about your processes your procedures and being implemented successfully on board the vessel now sire 2.0 is basically incorporating human factors so basically that's the best place where you can you can demonstrate these procedures are fully uh, complied by the seafarers so will there be any like you know in, uh, usefulness to the operators uh, going into 2.2 and uh, how does this uh, the whole human factor thing has been embedded into 2.2 okay right well again another very good question and um, i will answer part of that now and i will also answer part of it in my closing comments because obviously it's really really critical mm -hmm. um okay so sire 2 question guidance contains reference to tmsa kpis that are the most applicable to a top level question but many other K tmsa kpis may be applicable depending on what the inspector sees or hears during the questioning so it's a really really difficult thing to combine the two together um so we've we've had a you know, the initial effort at it and we think it works reasonably well but i'm sure that as we go forward as more experience is gained from the inspection processes you know there will be some slight modifications on how it's presented uh, and how it's done but 
realistically. Where a negative uh, process observation is made, the inspector will select the most appropriate KPI from those available in the process response tool um, as part of the negative observation. Because a negative observation consists of several parts, one of which is the TMSA selection, and the other one is a negative comment, and the, and the final one is, um, I've forgotten at the moment, it's off the top of my head. Um, anyway, so the selection of the TMSA KPI for a negative observation will assist the report recipient and the vessel operator with fully performance analysis against TMSA. Both those things that are declared as a yes in the TMSA submission and those that are aspired to in the later, um, you know, in, in the future. So just because um, the, the company has declared a yes, it doesn't mean that they've declared yes to everything. And some of the questions in SIRE too relate to things they may have said no to, but that might give them some indication of where they're, where they're going. So human factors is embedded in SIRE 2 by requiring an inspector to interact with the vessel staff and evaluate and report on the level of understanding and familiarization for each applicable question. And as Shiraz mentioned earlier, it, it's on a graduated scale from exceeds expectations to not as expected. And so that's really important that we will get a better view of how a ship is managed on the human aspect because an inspector has to answer the human response tool for every question where it's applicable. So we'll see lots of yeses. We'll see uh, some not as expected. We'll see some that exceed, exceeded expectations and we'll see some that was largely as expected. That paints a much better picture of what's going on board, on board a ship than the current situation where it's simply a yes or no to a question. And that yes or no may relate to any number of things. But rarely, as Shiraz pointed out, the human performance. And of course, humans are the machine that drives the ship. And if they're functioning well, with that number of data points against human performance, we'll see it. And if it's performing badly, again, that will be more evident. Um, okay, so some SIA 2 questions are TMSA validation processes. So um, where the inspector verifies the accuracy of PIQ information provided by the vessel operator, which can then be analyzed by vessel stroke managed fleet to evaluate overall TMSA KPI achievement or partial achievement. So what we see during TMSA reviews is many companies declare, declare stage four to many things which they're not really entitled to, particularly when it comes to navigation audits, cargo audits, mooring audits, and engineering audits. They say, yes, we do them. When you actually do the audit, you find that they've got a couple of questions in their ISM audit and say that was our that was our uh, engineering audit. So realistically, we set the questions up within SIA 2 to, to basically get the vessel operators to declare truly what they've done against each ship at each inspection. Mm. And of course, that data is then available to the purchaser of the report, and they can make their own opinion on, on that. But of course, we, uh, we, we sample the um, information provided by the vessel operator and then we have validation questions to make sure what they say is actually true. We don't look at every piece of information. We look at one or two pieces on every inspection. And that's basically to try and in, uh, enforce the vessel operator to on, honestly declare what they truly do. And of course, if they make the mistake of saying yes, well, we ne they'll never find it. We'll just say yes and see what happens. The answer is, well, if the inspectors follow the guidance, they will pick up on the fact that the vessel operator has said yes to something they truly haven't done and give a negative observation. So the consequence of saying yes to something you haven't done is far worse than just the saying the truth. Well, actually, we haven't done it because it's not an obligation to reach stage four. It's a, it, you know, it's a target. Uh, and of course, many companies uh, claim to do things they don't. So that's how it's all, all wrapped in uh, together. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. I think uh, you uh, very precisely tried to give us an oversight of the uh, new regime. I, th I think uh, in the uh, TMSA, tanker management and self-assessment, it's all about your self-declaration and it's not an obligation to do the thing. Precisely uh, putting the same approach inside 2.0 will also help the operators that, you know, what they uh, they have actually achieved or what they have not done yet. So it's, it's more or less like kind of a 
going uh, towards uh, uh, like you know achieving something not necessary that you have to do yes or no which is very a uh, right approach because i i think that way uh, going forward uh, it will be good for the industry also to gauge themselves and nothing better than self assessment you know uh, i would like to ask rachit that like you know rachit uh, i mean uh, given that uh, the situation of mental health issues and other thing which has been there for last two and a half year we have seen that uh, the whole uh, standards of the seafarers uh, i mean again it is given the situations were like that and and we do see there the deterioration in those standard uh, then how does it affect actually when we are talking about human factor now and we know that each and every uh, uh, questions are linked to the human factor Uh, how do we uh, uh, get the clear understanding uh, that it is not related to a uh, very short term uh, uh, you know the situations or it is a long term issue uh, uh, in your view actually the, how we are going to gauge that thing okay uh, thanks anjeev well uh, first of all uh, when we talk about the human factor now one thing uh, we should be clear that uh, you know human factor is not just about an individual yeah uh, it is a, a system where individuals interact uh, with uh, uh, let's say this uh, the person who is at the center of the task he is interacting with uh, with other crew members uh, with the sms on board the vessel uh, the processes the work environment uh, on the organization the, the company you know and and the equipment uh, uh, on which uh, an individual uh, works and operate so if you look into uh, one of the guiding principles of human factor and uh, that is that people are fallible yeah uh, so even the best crew member will make mistake now when such mistakes happens uh, by an individual uh, uh, statistics has shown that uh, you know 90% of the time it is caused by something other than just, uh, just an individual so uh, with this whole uh, sar 2.1 human factor coming in you know uh the intention is not uh, to let's say penalize uh, uh, the seafarer uh, on the contrary uh, it yes we can say if the observation comes yes it will be related to the seafarer but you know the whole intent is that you know it basically drives an organization to look into those systemic conditions uh, that drove an individual to react in in a manner and uh, that mean uh, made sense to uh, him or her at that time you know we which leads to uh, an error uh if you look into this uh, uh, swiss cheese model uh, for human factor you know see uh, seafarers uh, are the final barrier so uh, they are not uh, <clears throat> sorry so uh, they are also the final ones who will be get trained and educated uh, human factor when done in uh, in the right way it has to start from the top of the organization yeah and that is where uh, most impact uh, would happen yeah? because uh, it is uh, the leaders knowledge uh, their language and behavior that creates the vision uh, values and and culture uh, which influence the performance uh, of uh, onboard crew member yeah so uh, what i would recommend to all uh, uh, you know uh, listeners is that uh, and, and to vessel operators that to in order to get more clarity on on human factor assessment you know i would strongly recommend uh, uh, to uh, go and revisit okay paper on human factor management and self assessment uh, because this paper uh, really provides a good framework uh, on the concept of human factor and uh, how it can be integrated uh, uh, within companies uh, management system yeah thanks so much for referring to that paper that's an impo- important paper actually i think and, and that should be the like one of the must read or uh, paper for readers um captain sir as uh, uh, we heard a lot that like you know is 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 going to be the sea fairers this thing but i think uh, more than the sea fairers the operators are also getting influenced by the sai 2.0 we all know that the four sets of documents which need to be prepared prior to inspection by the operator uh, like you know, namely piq certificates photos and svpq now um 
how how do you see that like you know uh, uh, and and we uh, we are also in our industry uh, uh, not not everyone but i think partly we all talk about the micro management you know so how do you see that like you know uh, this the extra documentation uh, earlier was just one hppq and probably the pooh matrix which will remain same but the other three piq certificates and the photo repository will not add an extra burden uh, to the vessel uh, seafarers you know those working on board uh, whereas the, the time spent by the inspectors is still remaining eight to ten hours on board and uh, how do you see that like you know these things will not spill over from the operator side to the uh, vessels and uh, they themselves ending up doing lots yeah. of yeah. yeah thanks sanji for that um i think the one thing that operators have to understand um, for example let's look at the present system right the operators have a hvpq um, which is going from 5 to 6 in due course but let's talk about the hvpq as a document how often is it actually necessary to update it because a vast majority of the information contained within an hvpq is more or less static it lasts for at least 6 months or maybe more depending on the vessel um you're not doing let's say if you're doing inspections every 6 months or 3 months or whatever it is you may review your hvpq but you may not need to update anything no equipment is changing um more or less everything remains the same so when you review it you review it, you no know changes but it's done the date changes it appears on the hvpq as updated by operator on so and so day which all that means is that it's been it's been reviewed um as for the piq um i've heard a lot of people talking about oh it's going to take a long time to do for every inspection but again you have to understand that a lot of the information in the piq is again static information right a vast majority of it in fact um a few dates may change but that's it uh so you're going to you're going to you're going to update the hvpq the piq certificates again let's say your vessel has just had a docking a special survey your class certificate and all these certificates are valid for another 5 years you upload that how often are you going to have to change it once a year at annual surveys or the intermediate survey as the case may be so yes it's going to be a little bit more work for the operators and quite frankly i'm hoping that the operators do not try and pass this on to the ship because the ship staff have got enough to worry about without having to deal with that so yes I mean, the ship staff is going to have to take an interactive interest in this but uh, there's no reason for them to get involved with the piq or the hvpq now what we do here is we send we, the vessels have got the hvpq software the master inputs whatever information is available to him on board the ship and relevant to that time then he exports the data to us we complete our input check the whole thing and re-export the data to him so now he's got the completed hvpq um it is it is going to have to be a team effort all right now if you expect a small company to let's say with five superintendents to deal with all this then yes of course you're going to have an additional workload but the point is and the hard fact of the matter is you can either like it or lump it um there's no other way to look at it i mean it's got to be done i mean it's up to each individual company to decide how they want to go about doing this whether you want to bring in some more admin staff into the office or whether you're happy with the superintendents dealing with it or the betting manager or whoever but yeah so there is going to be a slightly more um amount of workload for this documentation at the beginning once the system is in place once you've uploaded the stuff once then it's only a few things that may be required to be uploaded and amended for each inspection um the benefit of this is that when the inspector goes on board he's not spending a whole pile of time looking at every piece of paper that exists on the ship uh, which is pretty much what happens now so he's just going to randomly check a couple of things to make sure that the piq um, submission is accurate that certificates that have been uploaded are in fact valid and if you look at the the guidance to that question for the certificates it says quite clearly that um no more than 5 to be reviewed by the inspector now of course 
I am quite sure that there are going to be inspectors who are going to look at more than just five. But by and large, the purpose of the PIQ is to cut down the amount of time that the inspector harasses ship staff for records and dates and this and that. Uh, so it's going to ease, in fact, the ship staff load as far as documentation is concerned. Um, it's going to put a little more pressure on the office, but then that's what the office is there for. We are there to support the ship staff, not to dump the load on onto them. Um, so you know, um, the inspector could then focus on what is actually going on on board the ship, rather than just looking at papers. Um, he inter he'll interact more with the ship staff uh, to see what's going on, how they are performing, how aware are they of what the requirements are, both by way of the industry requirements, both and also the operator's requirements. So yeah, a slight amount of workload, but at the end of the day, something that needs to be done and there's no getting away with it. Yeah, very precisely you put down that like, you know, operators need to also stand up and do their part, not just pushing everything to seafarers. And uh, obviously, uh, the, the goal for everybody is, is the same to improve the safety standards on board the vessel because no seafarers, no operators in this world wants to have an accident on board. Uh, of course, the same charters and the car owners also. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, when we when we talk about like, like you know, I mean, uh, uh, bit of uh, on the IT side, uh, and, and I'm very sure that Duncan, uh, as he described earlier, the the different sets of the questions, the core questions, and the various rotational question comes into that play. Um, uh, I would like to ask Duncan that, like, you know, will it be anything in the for future that uh, a kind of the data which has been collected uh, for for certain operator or some like you know, those who are uh, getting inspected in this regime, will it be available in certain like you know IT savvy format, call it XML or any other format where the operators can use this data? To build some kind of BI within their framework and and analyze the gaps uh, more closely in order to remove those uh, you know negative aspect within their operations and and improve the operation you know so do you see that like you know is there some sort of thought or discussions are happening in the Okim or somewhere else? Okay, good question. So Okim has and will publish all information necessary to understand the SIA two inspection process on its SIA two webpage. Um, so what you see is what you get. Um, the documents that are on the web webpage are largely protected to stop people just extracting the data and commercializing it. Mm -hmm. It's all available for use, um, but obviously it might take some effort on the parts of the people who want to use it to put it in the format that they need it. It's not our job to provide everything in the way that you want it. We've provided it to you. Uh, to the industry, it's completely freely available uh, and all information can be used in accordance with the OCIV program's terms and conditions, which will be republished very shortly. Um, so if you look, there's one very specific document, which is called the SIA2 program uh, question library programming attributes and virtually everything that makes the SIA to uh, compiler and all of the systems work is available within that document. It's just, we're not gonna produce it in an open spreadsheet because we reserve the right to update it at any time that we see fit. Mm -hmm. And in the end, it's, it's used at the user's own risk. If they want to take data out of it and use it, then they can, but it's not then our problem if they make a mistake or use it inappropriately. We published it, it's available. Uh, and certainly you can reconstruct the entire SI2 program almost because we've retained only several pieces of information which make the system work because it's our proprietary system. We're not going to just give everything away so the industry can just create their own system and copy it. Um, so in the end, it's not to do to make life difficult, but it's to protect the integrity of the system that we've published it, but we're not releasing it in a copyable and editable format so that we know that if it's out there, it, the only source is the documents that we've produced. Thank you. Yeah, so if I understand correctly that like, you know, probably the whole, uh, uh, the spreadsheet, which is, I have seen that spreadsheet is quite in detail actually. So the, the and it's, it's available on the public domain. So the companies can use that one together with the reports which they receive and they can, 
they can use it in their own system in their own way but uh, there won't be any like you know i mean a certain format uh, reports in certain data formats which they would like to uh, you know in, incorporate in the in the bi system and then in, uh, use that one for improving their own system. So uh, fair enough, actually, as long as something is available uh, for the industry to take it out from there and use it for their own betterment, uh, that should be uh, that should be good enough. Actually, I, I'm, I'm very sure that going forward, a lot of things will be also discussed because we are moving away from conventional static, uh, you know, uh, the report based system to more data driven system, actually, where the things can be uh, much better and uh, very much predicted well in advance before something goes wrong. Yeah, so uh, Going forward, the Hermit. Uh, uh, now we heard that a lot of the things will be uh, kind of a data driven and everything. And I'm very sure the charters will also be closely, very closely watching it. So, do you see that, like you know, going forward? And again, I'm just predicting. Uh, it may not be the case uh, that the the burdens uh, on on the screw in terms of frequent SIR inspections, like you know, often it has been called that, like you know, do a SIR inspection uh, in, in two to three months time or less than two months time because there is a need for the a valid report uh, of uh, unsaid rule of six months uh, before the next voice conclude. Do you see that, like, you know, if we predict it correctly, that, you know, more and more data sets will be available. And if anybody wants to really use the data set within their own framework, they can use it. So do we, uh, can we see that, like, you know, those frequency can be extended and not called for the frequent side inspections? Uh, so to correctly answer your question, Again, I would say that this could not be something which will immediately be visible. Uh, uh, the frequency of uh, uh, frequency of the uh, SIR inspections, because you must realize most of the charter parties which have been agreed, especially for period deals, mm -hmm. uh, they have done they have been done much before pandemic or during the pandemic. So they are basically on the boilerplate wording that six months, for instance, hypothetically with the old uh, SIR system. When we basically transform and mitigate, uh, migrate to this new system, mm -hmm. uh, then probably it might happen. The implementation is successful, lesser number of incidents, stakeholders realize that the periodicity could be stretched from six to nine months. So that could be probably, it depends upon the succession plan, how the whole thing uh, rolls out to the industry, how it is implemented, what is the residual after effect, is it effective? So it's too early to really answer that question. Uh, but uh, you know what, uh, since these basically what I try correctly understand from the experts here on this uh, panel and the speakers, uh, it's more of a system which is designed, which is going to basically give you uh, algorithms and right questions to be asked to the ship, identifying the exact problems. So it's a more, uh, you know, realistic uh, inspection approach rather than the old con conventional approach whereby every ship, even the newest ship to the oldest ship is subjected to the same questionnaire, same inspection regime. So this is probably going to be a big change here. So as the stakeholders realize that there is a lot of value and the, uh, you know, the, the uh, uh, probability of uh, issues getting slipping through the cracks will reduce probably this will happen. That will be, you know, this is how they're going to mitigate the cost, right? At the end of the day, anybody who utilizes tonnage, he wants a safe ship. If you demonstrate that this system is more effective in assuring a safe ship, then probably that is the next question which will come. Nobody wants to spend extra money, right? So it is, uh, depends upon the effectiveness. That's the whole thing, right? Yeah, thanks, uh, uh, Harmita. And just take it further on the same thing. Like, you know, I mean, uh, we talked earlier that uh, uh, we should be moving, moving away from quanti uh, quantitative to qualitative observations. And uh, uh, do you think that, like, you know, I mean, go going further, the stakeholders and uh, not just the oil majors, but also the charters, uh, going to review these uh, reports more precisely, not just based on the numbers, and also analyzing the, the, the quality of the ships in terms of risk perspective, uh, much better and compared to the old system. So <clears throat> Sanjeev, over the years I've realized, I've seen in last probably decade or 15, 20 years, that before any commercial interest, any oil major, any person utilizing the ship used to see the number of observations. Now the number has become to high risk observations versus low risk observations. They say one odd high risk observation 
even if you are probably two observations and one high risk comes in between your basically utility reduces your basically market uh, uh, your marketability of the ship uh, reduces now that is already a level of maturity a uh, uh, notch above obviously with the new system coming up if there is more uh, identifiable causes whereby a ship cannot be used for xyz reason then that's another step towards uh, you know right implementation of the sire system so we are already seeing a shift in people's approach towards sire it is not the number of observations it is the quality it's already a, a low risk or a high risk observation and there are some, sometimes there are probably eight observations which are very small not relevant but sometimes there are like two observations which are high risk area, uh, high risk area observations then uh, the approach changes of a charter so people are already uh, you know coming to that level and i think probably with this new system it will uh, improve further so uh, captain suraj do, do you do you agree that like you know when I mean, now we have the categorization of hardware processor and human factors and one single observation can lead into the three different uh, observations and the numbers will be appearing much higher than the before uh, how how do the operators uh, do uh, see that things and uh, how do are uh, prepared to deal with such kind of things and which one should take the higher uh, priority whether it's a human factor related hardware related or processor related um well first of all i think that the basic concept and the basic approach on the part of operators or owners we've got to move away from that we were a kpi of 1.67 observations per inspection we have to move away from that we have to understand now that with the new system that is coming into force it is more about the quality of the observation the impact that that observation may have on the marketability the employment of the vessel and it also i believe gives the op the operator an opportunity to understand what's going on on the ships particularly now during the covid period all right things are opening up now and possibly by the time sir 2.0 is actually rolled out there will be no more restrictions but there are still places in the world where there are severe restrictions and it's difficult to get an inspector on board the ship now let's assume that the sir 2.0 program was already in place a sir 2.0 report if it's done properly and diligently by the inspector helps the uh, the operator understand what is going on board of his ships because the operators have also had trouble getting people onto their ships to see what's actually going on see the condition and so on so um remote inspections remote uh, superintendent visits all very well but it just does not replace a physical presence um so i think operators need to look at this whole new regime the whole new sars system in a positive manner um when the question set was rolled out i had um tons of messages coming towards me coming on on my phone saying that okay for gone nuts they've got a 1400 page question set so i had to i i i've lost count of the number of times i had to respond saying that it's not 1400 pages of questions it's 1400 pages of questions plus a heck of a lot of guidance um so if you read that yep yeah, yeah, then it comes to that but the other thing is i mean people have also raised a question that under the present system people knew what questions were coming and they were calling it like an open book exam um there is really no difference you got viq7 which had the question and the guidance which the inspector had to follow and you've got sai 2.0 where you've got the inspection question the via a cviq question you've got so much guidance it tells you exactly why that question is there tells you what the underlying requirements are it even gives you things like what the inspector is likely to do when he approaches that question okay and it also tells you what potential negative observations can be raised now obviously these lists are not comprehensive but it's a good place to look at people of the operator as well as the ship staff so it's a better it's an easier open book question if you ask me than the existing system the existing system gave guidance but the inspector had the ability to go outside that guidance and give an observation that was relevant to that question so it was subject to a lot of interpretation but now things are much more clear and so you know i think it's 
time the industry looks at things like this, like the new program, in a more positive manner and understand that it's there to not only assist the charter and the oil major in understanding what the ship's about, but also help the operator in understanding what their guys are doing and where the weaknesses lie. So you can then address that and deal with it. Very precisely, I think you have put it down uh, in the existence system. I think a lot of uh, guidance uh, which can be interpreted in either way. Uh, but uh, you're very right, actually, if, you, if someone who has seen the, those guidance and those, uh, you know, uh, 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 the details available inside 2.0. This is very precise, actually. And now you've got, as you rightly said, much open book examination. You know, you need to just read it, 1,400 pages. <laughs> it's just time. Uh, I'm reading helps you sleep. Great. Uh, uh, Duncan, uh, I mean, uh, uh, again, a lot depends when we are analyzing the human factors on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, how does the SIRE inspectors are going to be analyzing them psychologically or on the social factor, language barriers, the different cultures. And uh, uh, so all those human interactions between the inspectors and the seafarers. Uh, uh, in terms of like, you know, whatever questions they've been asking. So how, how do you see that? Like, you know, because the bunch of inspectors are, uh, are, are those like, you know, who are from current uh, current regime of science inspection program, how well they are trained actually to, to really look and, uh, you know, modify themselves, you know, how to ask the question and how to narrate their answers in a, in a positive or negative way. Okay, well, that's, I mean, obviously that's a good question. It's not one that I'm not as qualified to answer as some of the others. But I mean, as Shiraz mentioned earlier, the SIRE inspectors have all been through some very comprehensive training. Uh, they had to do a 24 hour uh, remote uh, training session before they even took the five day um, transition and SIRE 2 course, um, which included a, a one day of um, role playing with the human factors. So, you know, that was a really big program and, and Shiraz took part in that. Now, since he's left, obviously, there's been a, a second round of training, which has included the uh, inspectors having to uh, address certain scenarios that were put to them in training uh, and then uh, provide their answers back to Akim, which were then answered and uh, marked and moderated. So, you know, there has been an awful lot of effort put in to this training by Akim and also by the individual inspectors. Now, not all inspectors passed the first round of training. Where they didn't pass, they had to do further learning, and then they had to uh, retake the exams. This is also true of the second round of training. Uh, and most of the issues that are being picked up is really around the human factors of the inspectors, is they didn't understand how to do something, or they hadn't bothered to read it, or whatever it happens to be. But the point is, no inspector is going to be let loose uh, into the SIA 2 world until they've done the full site Occam Sire 2 conversion training. And in the end, some people might say, well, they can still go out and do what they want and just behave in the same way. That is one of the learnings from the trial inspections is inspectors very easily fall back into the, the old ways of doing things. Uh, and of course, we're very aware of that. It will take time. You know, you're not going to get perfect results immediately. But as inspectors do one, two, three, four inspections, they get better and better at doing it. And, they, and the penny drops and they, and they then realize what they've been trained, and what they do in practice, uh, and they get better. So overall, um, you know, the, the inspectors are, are trained to look out for positive and negative behavior and to report on what they see. That's it. What do they see? What do they hear? And then they report on it. And that could be exceeded expectations all the way through to not as expected. Um, obviously, there will be a period during which, uh, you know, and some inspectors don't quite get it right, but there is a process to evaluate the inspection reports through in OCIMF, not just with the submitting members. Uh, and where we identify weaknesses with inspectors, there will be ongoing programs of mentoring and, uh, and further training to try and make sure that the full potential of the uh, human factors uh, aspect of SIA 2 is realized. That's really all I can say on that, so thank you. 
Thank you, thank you, Duncan. I think uh, uh, very precisely put across that uh, uh, you know it's it's a process actually, and I think over the period of time we we'll, we we'll each learn. And and I always say that like not to forget that inspectors are not the god, and they are not coming. They are not aliens. Also, they are just part of one of us actually. And it, it will just a matter of time they will understand the system and things can be taken in positive way. Uh, Rachit, uh, I mean uh, uh, again a lot we talk about the human factor and. Uh, I mean, uh, how do you see that, like, you know, this uh, the regime of 2.0 will help uh, proactively to address this human factor, and uh, which is the root cause for most of the, you know, investigation, right, and investigation happening across. across. And uh, do you see that, like, you know, this uh, footprint uh, in sustainability or ESC will be in uh, compliance, will be enhanced if we tackle this human factor and, and thus can help the entire industry and not just improve the safety performance, but also in terms of, you know, uh, ESC components for the companies. Uh, okay, Sanjeev. Uh, well, first of all, I uh, tend to disagree with the statement, which, you know, uh, we say that, uh, you know, a human element is the, is the root cause of uh, most of the maritime investigation. <laughs> uh, I, Yes, uh, if uh, you say that uh, most of the maritime incidents are caused by human error, yes, I completely agree uh, on on that. Yeah. However, uh, if we correctly apply uh, the application of human factor, yeah, then uh, as I said earlier, also uh, ninety percent of the cases, the root cause uh, would not be related to the human error, but to the uh, systemic error. <laughs> So uh, there's a, uh, there's a, this is one of the big shift uh, which uh, I see, you know, which uh, this human factor is, is bringing in. Uh, okay, human factor in shipping in, in maritime, it is uh, again a fairly uh, new world. Uh, but if you look into uh, some, some other industries, uh, you know, nuclear aviation, you know, which are very highly regulated industry, uh, in, in those industries, uh, compliance uh, does not necessarily, uh, you know, equal to improve uh, capacity or resilience, uh, you know, or high reliability of uh, of uh, excellence. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, so in any organization, uh, you know, we can uh, really take uh, two approaches. <clears throat> First is, you know, we just work towards uh, uh, demonstrating uh, the compliance, you know, which is very easy to achieve. Yeah. Uh, but the second approach is uh, uh, to go beyond compliance and to, and to work uh, work towards excellence, which uh, definitely is is challenging. And when we talk about sustainability, you know, uh, an organization or an individual uh, should be in the in the second approach uh, to take. Uh, so uh, basically, yes, one has to has to step out, uh, think uh, out of the box. Now, in any incident, uh, it is easy to blame an individual, yeah, and and close uh, the investigation with further training, uh, briefing, or in some case, uh, even uh, uh, sacking that individual, yeah, or or we we add uh, some more procedures. Now, how often we actually look uh, into the conditions? which influence uh, that individual to make an error. So uh, it is important that, uh, you know, we revisit uh, our root cause analysis technique uh, and amend uh, the same to help uh, identify the systems and conditions uh, that make errors more likely. So that is something which, uh, which we, should, should, we should work on. Uh, we should remember that uh, if uh, we fix an individual, yeah, we will fix the problem for now. But if we fix the system, uh, we will fix the problem for good. Uh, so human factor, yes, it it do plays uh, a very important role uh, now in, uh, in in maritime investigations. Uh, we all have been doing investigations, but there is a need uh, to relook into the way we carry out the investigation. Again. Uh, one of the five pillars in uh, Ockham's paper on human factor is actually focusing uh, specifically on on incident investigation. So, again, uh, a, a need to look into that paper. Great, uh, thanks, Rachid. Captain uh, Sir, uh, uh, I mean, uh, your bit uh, that like we talked about the uh, human factor. Uh, how do you see that? Like, you know, how should we prepare uh, uh, from the SIPS staff perspective? For SAI 2.0, what 
the companies or what individuals should be doing actually i mean do you have some guidelines uh, or some some kind of suggestions actually for the listeners uh, that like you know what should be they start focusing when they are start looking because all these words you will find and other things are coming and sometimes it might be just going on top of your head but what is a simple way of understanding and preparing the sub staff i think uh, one of the main things for any vetting regime whether it's sire or psc or any other um is to understand what the system is about um so i would strongly recommend that people are familiarized with the sire 2.0 regime to understand where it came from why it's come about because there's a lot of confusion in the industry like now right we had this one headache and now we've got this other headache which seems to be a bigger headache so you know why are we doing all this um if there's an understanding of what the system is it helps it definitely helps understand how okim have developed this program how you can benefit even as a seafarer from these inspections um but again um coming back to the new aspect of human factors what rachit said is absolutely correct um the human being does not make a mistake because of his own inherent failings he makes a mistake because the system is not geared to help him do his job properly so we like to say okay human error but we have to look deeper than that and go and see why has there been a human error um so that's what the focus of investigations really should be to get to the absolute root we normally stop at okay root cause second mate didn't know this or the chief engineer didn't know that and a lot of responses to vetting observations so far have been this and additional training has been given but going back again it's a question like you know why did you need to give additional training why didn't he already know this why what was wrong with the system um but again to help the ship staff deal with inspectors now that is coming on to interpersonal relationships now during the inspector training for example i'll give you a small example inspectors spent about an hour and a half just talking about the opening meeting with the master and other officers with the um, human factors trainers all right so it was basically to establish a rapport and mutual trust and the inspector believes that okay the the ship staff are not going to hide stuff from me and i'm going to be open with them tell them exactly what it is i'm going to look at and what i expect from them so that rapport is established so like i said they've spent a lot of time training inspectors on this now one of the pifs um, you know, they've got human factors assessed in terms of uh, uh, performance influencing factors and it is important for the ship staff uh, because we're not the office is not going to be um, assessed on pifs or human factors we're going to be sitting in the comfort of our air conditioned offices the ship staff are the front line they're going to have to deal with it so how do you deal with this confidently and the only real answer i can give for that is think back to your school days if you were going for an exam and you knew the subject matter properly you were confident if you didn't know it you were still nervous i mean even if you knew it you were still nervous but you were able to deal with it now when an inspector asks a question of a ship staff or officer or rating um he's not standing there with a stopwatch saying okay no the guy didn't answer me in 10 seconds and therefore he doesn't know so the ship staff need to understand and the inspector needs to understand that all right there are differences there are cultural differences especially amongst Asians where we tend to look at seniors as infallible and you know godlike stature um and so they're afraid to speak up they're nervous so it's up to the inspector then to put the guy at ease all right so he ends up talking to you as a professional rather than inspector to um to see fair so a know your subject know your stuff know what the procedures are know how they're supposed to be implemented and it's not difficult there's nothing different to what they should be already doing on the ship it's just a different way of assessing that so yeah train the guys to understand what the system is about tell them that it's important for them to know what's going on you don't want staff on board your ships who don't understand what the company's procedures are or don't care what the procedures are 
Um, so if it's the latter, then you've got a bigger problem on your hands than just someone not understanding them. So yeah, I think that's the main thing. They need to be familiar with the system, familiar with the questions. And obviously now a second mate does not need to be familiar with what the engine room is doing. He just looks at his own domain, all right? And the poor captain needs to look at just about everything. If you look at the, so at the question set, almost every single question is, does the master, are the master and X, Y, Z familiar? So the master is pretty much messed up mentally. Um, he's got to be this in-house genius, um, which hopefully is the case. I mean, there's no reason why it can't be that. I mean, I've dealt with um, ship masters who have been so good um, where the chief mate couldn't answer a question about the cargo system the master has. So, you know, it, it, there are these people, I mean, and it is up to the companies to instill that confidence in them, to support them. And if you do that, I think then you'll have it to be quite a smooth transition. I think very precisely, but that, that's the one question where you rightly put in the end, actually, the master and the officer or the engineer. I think uh, uh, the companies really need to uh, look uh, very, very carefully. And obviously, uh, when, when it says master and the officer and the engineer, it's, it's not that the master has to answer every question, but he needs to be aware and familiar with what's there. You know, That's what is his understanding from there. It's simple, the buck stops there. Right? Yeah. So if anything goes wrong, he's the first guy to, stand, to be in the firing line. So it is understandable that he should be the one familiar with things. Great. Uh, uh, Duncan, I, I, I had one question for you, and it, it was just looming for this thing, because we are talking a lot that in the new regime, uh, I mean, a lot of work can be done by the inspector while he's there on board, because with the help of tablet, a lot of questions can be answered and everything. So do we see that there is a shortening of the period uh, when the reports can be uh, made available, much shorter duration compared to the older regime? Uh, well, we tried to do that, but there was too much pushback, uh, because in the end, uh, the industry made some very good points mm -hmm. that you're going to raise some very esoterical type responses or negative observations about people's performance. Mm -hmm. And we cannot just give a very quick answer. We have to look about it, look into it, and we have to think about it. So originally, we were going to bring it down to, I think it was five working, uh, five calendar days for uh, the vessel operators to give their comments. Mm -hmm. um, but they made some very good comments that, you know, we need to look into this. We need to give the right answer. We need to look beyond this personal failure. We look, need to look into the system failure before we can give our comments. And that was accepted. And so we went back to the old situation where it would be 10 working, uh, 10 calendar days from the day that the report was released to the vessel operator until it was, it was automatically published. So realistically, uh, there won't be much change, I think, in that because we're asking people to do different things which are more complicated. Over time, perhaps, uh, people will get quicker at it, but the, the rules are, are there, and, there, and, and there, that's, that's the way that we'll be working for the time being. So no change in that particular area. Uh, and, and, and my question was uh, precisely to the inspector that, do you see that earlier it was given like 72 hours to submit the report to the members? Will that can be uh, I mean, sorted into like 24 hours or something? Because now most of the data report details, everything is available now on his tablet. Well, it could be really yeah. Yeah. The, the point is, is it technically can be released a lot more quickly. But realistically, we also have to recognize we live in the real world. We can't create rules that can't be followed. Mm -hmm. So I think the rule is we're sticking at 72 hours. It must be submitted. Obviously, submitting companies should do data analysis of inspectors to see how quickly they, they release them, just as Ockham does. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously have a word with people who are taking longer than reasonable. After all, if the guy is offshore and there's no internet connection, he can't upload the inspection. So therefore, we can't start creating artificial rules to penalise people. We have to recognise that they need to do their job, do it properly, and when it's done, upload it. But realistically, the report, for all intents and purposes, should be largely finished by the time the inspector leaves the ship. They will need to do their grammar checks, spelling checks, perhaps add a few um, additional comments just to in, in improve the value of the report, and then they can submit it. Um, but essentially, I think the, we're still leaving it at 72 hours as the, as the guidance to submitting companies. But remember, 
It's the submitting companies that are responsible for the performance of their inspectors. OCIMF only gives guidelines. So, uh, you know, it's up to them to, to, to push their inspectors to get it out quicker. Thank you. Yeah, and, and there's one more follow-up question actually uh, pertaining to the same subject actually, because we're talking about uh, uh, now inspections and we all know that inspections are now being uh, channelized through the OCIMF platform. Uh, often it happens that uh, in the last moment, for some reason, the submitting members appointed inspectors uh, falls out like, you know, and, and, and there's a, a desperate need of uh, getting, reaching out to another submitting members to this thing. So now in the old regime, it was like, okay, uh, much easier actually, because the, the one submitting member has to cancel the bookings and the next one has to cancel it. Uh, but in the new regime, we have a couple of documents like, uh, you know, the PIQs, uh, you know, photo repositories and uh, document repository, a certificate repository has to be. So will it be like, you know, transferred to another submitting members and, and even in, in, in the short span of time, if the operator need to reach out to another submitting members, they don't have to run through the same long process? Okay. Uh, well, it's an interesting question. It's obviously a good one, but it's an interesting one. Um, so, so first of all, the industry has to recognise that SIA 2 is a different type of inspection and it's not designed to be done at the last minute, you know, because obviously the uh, CVIC has to be uh, transmitted to the inspector's tablet. The inspector has to do the pre-work before they go on board the ship. Um, so OCINF will not be, uh, or SIA 2, will not prevent the late booking of inspections. OK, but OCINF will be evaluate, uh, analysing the data about how submitting companies and vessel operators uh, conduct their booking and uh, requesting um, behaviour. And then obviously where there's a significant deviation on a regular basis from the recommended uh, behaviour, obviously OCINF will then use its quality assessors to go out and have a chat with these organisations and say, but why are you doing this? In the end, we understand on a very occasional basis, there may be a need to uh, change an inspection at the very last minute, but realistically, that shouldn't be the norm. And where vessel uh, submitting companies are using it as the norm, then essentially they're not following the SIA 2 program, and they would technically be in breach of the terms of conditions of the program. So uh, what else can we say about that? So realistically, when you look at it holistically, each vessel operator must develop their own inspection request strategies and criteria to ensure that the system functions effectively. Each submitting company must also develop their own inspection booking strategies and criteria to ensure the system functions effectively. And changing the subject slightly, report recipients need to develop their own screening systems to recognise the OCIM principle that all reports are equal. Demanding a further inspection will not garner more or different information since all inspections conducted are conducted on the same basis. And really one of the most common reasons for these late inspections is a charter is suddenly saying, but we need an additional inspection to be done by a different submitting company. But the answer is they're not going to get a different answer by asking a different submitting company than the inspection that was carried out six weeks ago, because this inspection process should be consistent across all inspectors. They shouldn't get a different or vastly different result uh, with a different inspector or a different submitting company. Um, and certainly that is the aim of SIA 2, to bring everything into a level, level playing field. Mm -hmm. So essentially, late bookings is not impossible, um, but they've got to, people have got to recognise that there is several processes going on in the background. And if they haven't taken place, the inspector cannot do the inspection because the inspector inspection won't be on their tablet device. Obviously, vessel operators can always keep their um, PIQs, photographs, and certificates up to date. So that's really not a limiting factor. The most important limiting factor is the acceptance of a booking and the transfer of the information to the inspector's tablet and the inspector being able to review the material before they go on board to conduct the inspection. But this will become clear through some of the guidance that we're going to be publishing in the next few weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. And I think uh, we have overshoot the time also. Uh, I, I didn't realize that got carried away. And we have this 15 minutes overshooting our original time. Uh, 
this thing. Um, I think there are lots and lots of questions actually popping in and uh, um, unfortunately uh, can't be uh, taking all the questions, uh, uh, but uh, definitely we'll get back to the uh, uh, the viewers uh, on as much of questions uh, replies we can get from the speakers and uh, try to reply you back on through email uh, but i'll just stick still take uh, one or two questions from the viewers actually uh, if you all allow me because it sounds to be a little interesting actually and curious also uh, jimmy sir uh, are we okay all right, great. Uh, there's one question from a, 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 a listener, and he says that, like, you know, the core core VIQ questions actually will there be a kind of a guidance uh, that which VIQ questions, core VIQ questions are linked for the human uh, factor, or it will be depending on the inspector to uh, to choose whether how far he will go down inside a question to 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 really link that particular question to the human human factor. Okay, but I'll take that question. It's very simple. It's all published on the SIA2 website. The guidance is very clear. Mm. Um, if the question's in the CVIC, the inspector must ask it and he must uh, take the appropriate, follow the appropriate guidance. Mm. So absolutely every aspect of the inspection is, is published already. And, uh, you know, the, the programming is all there. So hopefully, if you need to know more, just go and look on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question is that, like, you know, I mean, since we are talking about the, the inspection report, which will be available on the OKIM for the operator includes the comment, uh, will that inspection report will cover, uh, co will be covering, like, you know, just the, the questions like see uh, core VIQ questions, rotational questions and everything, or it will cover some other questions like which the operators have already submitted from their end. So it's like, in other words, is, is it will it be just the inspection report done by the inspector on board, or it is the whole inspection, including the operator's declaration, as well as the inspector's on board? Okay, well, that's a good point. So the PIQ information that's provided by the vessel operator, where it's pertinent to a question library question, mm. there is two ways of treating it. If mm. the question is included in the CVIC for that inspection, mm. the information relevant from the PIQ is published underneath that question. So you know exactly what the, the vessel operator said, uh, either through the PIQ or the HVPQ, and the inspector verified during the process of the inspection. Now, much of the PIQ data is, is related to rotational questions, many of which won't be included in the CVIC for that particular inspection. Mm -hmm. But that data is not lost because it's all available at the end of the inspection report as unverified data. Mm -hmm. So that data is still presented to the re report recipient, but obviously the caveat is that it's been not been verified by the vessel operator and use it at your risk. But the way that we've set up SIA2 is that the vessel operator never knows which piece of information is going to be reviewed during the SIA2 inspection. And therefore, they would be foolish to publish anything that wasn't accurate. And certainly, I would suggest that any vessel operator that goes down that route will very quickly get their fingers burned by getting negative observations for falsely declaring something that occurred that didn't. So what we're trying to do is prevent a very, so present is a very clear picture of the ship's uh, activities, the vessel operator's supervision of that ship and the incidents that have occurred to it. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, th I think precisely you have put down everything. Uh, uh, it is definitely like I mean, um, uh, it is it is uh, it is up to the the user of the report actually to use that report. And obviously, uh, again, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's not that like you know, it's going to get a, the, the entire spectrum of the thing, but it's just kind of a snapshot of that particular thing, as well as a lot of things which has been now inbuilt. And that is uh, leads to me a next question, and probably this will be the last question. I'm just an interesting question that T. Uh, uh, TMSA declaration forms a part of a dynamic aspect of SIA 2.0. Uh, does it mean that uh, every vessel's review would maintain a review of owner's TMA submission as well? And I believe this meant for the SIA inspector. So, really, I, I have to answer this question because the SIA inspector, I don't think he could know the answer to this question um, from what we've published anyway. There is no linkage between a vessel operator's TMSA submission and SIA 2. 
Okay, there is no linkage whatsoever. So the inspector will not see the vessel operator's uh, TMSA declaration, nor will anybody else. Mm -hmm. However, the, the PIQ information that's provided by the vessel operator will allow somebody to work out backwards by data, data analysis what level a vessel operator has actually achieved through the through the data mining. So sorry to jump in there, Shiraz, but I, I, this is really important to get this point out there. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. I think uh, you took all the questions actually, but precisely all the questions which I could see uh, in, in, in the chat box is primarily asking the questions towards OCM of that, why they're doing this one and why doing that one. But uh, again, I think it's good to clear all those doubts and uh, you know come out with a clear answer. My final questions to all the speakers and probably you can uh, um, uh, take a minute too, is that like, you know, um, if this 2.0 is expected, expected to change everything for the good, then why the operators or the owners are hesitate to adopt it? Why there are so much of doubts? Why there are so much of clouds? Probably in your words, a minute or two, and probably that could be a closing comment from your side also. Um, okay. okay. Uh, um, having recently changed my hat, um, I can't speak for every operator, but I can tell you what's happening here. Um, we have to, and luckily I'm happy to report that we are looking at this in a positive way. We already understand that there are shortcomings in what we do and how we do it. So we have introduced additional modules in our CBT. We are looking at additional training methods. I mean, one way of doing it, there are companies out there that do training for people um, Ratchet's company is one of them. Um, you got companies like NavGuide Solutions who do things. Um, so it might be worthwhile looking at those kind of things. Um, but I think the main reason for the apprehension on part of um, operators is the, um, shall we say, the uh, uncertainty of how inspections are going to be done. How are ship staff going to be dealt with? Um, is there going to be a blame culture in place? If something goes wrong, an inspection goes badly, um, let's say someone on the ship is reported as, a, you know, as his response was not as expected, um, how do the operators intend on dealing with that? Because everything goes hand in hand. There's a manning crisis right now. Um, thank you very much, Russia. Um, but... Uh, uh, if you start penalizing your seafarers, then you're going to be short of them again. So there has to be an understanding that, right, the whole system is geared towards enhancing what's going on in the industry. Um, the shipping industry already lags far behind the aviation industry in safety awareness. Um, and this is something that brings us one step closer to that standard. So I think we need to look at it positively instead of with apprehension. Go in with an open mind, see how things work out. And there is always going to be an evolutionary period where things or people are going to be scratching their heads trying to figure out how to respond to certain things. But much like the original SIA program, people will figure it out in due course. And people will understand what they need to do to get rid of observations on the human factors side, which are negative. Um, so again, you could get observations which are positive on the human factor side for an officer. Um, the only problem is you will not be able to identify the officer through the report. It will only be mentioned as the accompanying officer or, you know, things of like that, or a senior engineer or a you know, junior engineer, whatever. But it doesn't take much for the ship operator to know which person in, on the board was involved. So I think yeah, um, the apprehension is mainly through an uncertainty. Um, it's also in some parts due to a negative view of the entire SIA program, whether it be the existing one or the new one. Um, there are times when an, as an inspector, you go on board and Sanjeev, you must have experienced this as well during your days as an inspector, you're looked upon as, as the enemy. And a lot of seafarers have this feeling that you're there to find what's wrong. Um, so operators need to understand that with the new system, Yes, that is part of the inspector's job, but he's also there to find out what's right and report on that as well. 
Very well, precisely. Now we have a reason actually that to welcome the inspector because you can show that you how good you are. Just make sure the food good. That's all. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, next speaker uh, would like to go for a final yeah. one or two. Yeah, I'll, I'll go next because I, I think this is a really important point. Is the question that you asked? It's a leading question which makes a gener generalized presupposition. Mm. Okay, so Ockimf has been engaging with Intertanker and other industry bodies who have been generally supportive of the SIA 2 process. So they recognize that SIA 2 will allow charters to discriminate between companies that expend appropriate effort and resources to ensure their vessels are maintained and managed to high standards and those that don't. So those companies that have nothing to worry about and they are well-managed ships, they're, they're looking forward to it because they are going to be able to be seen above those vessel operators and, and companies that don't make the effort, don't train their people, don't evaluate the standards on board. And of course, that's, that they see that as a, as a positive benefit coming out of SIA too. And those companies that truly know what's going on in SIA too, recognize the potential. Obviously there are risks and pitfalls along the way, uh, which other people have alluded to, but hopefully with the training and the, 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 the submitting companies review of their own reports and the enhancement of their own uh, uh, governance, we should see a much better uh, performance coming out of it. So in the end, not all operators are hesitant to adopt it. And many of them are looking forward to it because they see it as an opportunity. Um, I would just take the opportunity to give a few wrap up comments from my perspective, because obviously uh, I'm, I'm here to try and project what's needed from, from the Occam side. Um, so the principal audience for this webinar should recognize that the data mining opportunities that SIA2 offers will allow charters to identify vessels which are maintained and managed the highest standards. That's what your, your whole uh, reason of existence is. The most important leading indicator of how well a vessel is managed is the amount of time a vessel operator spends on board their managed vessels, assessing the management operational standards on board. This can't be achieved by an inspector in eight hours, but it can be achieved by a vessel operator by doing focused, specialised audits, inspections and everything else, all of which are covered in TMSA. The pre-inspection uh, questionnaire information provided through the SIA 2 inspection report will provide a clear insight into the effort and resources expended by each operator in the oversight of their vessels. The lagging indicators of effective management will also be provided in a SIA 2 inspection report since vessel operators must declare the incidents that have occurred on or to their vessels in the previous 12 months. And the number of negative observations raised during a SIA 2 inspection is likely to reflect the effort that a vessel operator puts into managing the vessels on a day-to-day basis. The data to evaluate this will be relevant to the report recipient. So in the end, if, as other people have mentioned earlier, if a vessel operator doesn't take the time to train their staff and evaluate them, what do they expect to happen when people go on board to do the inspections? They, they will likely have poor performance because they haven't done what is necessary to provide a well-managed uh, and maintained uh, business platform. Okay, but the final point I'd like to make, anyone can have a bad day. So people need to look at the overall picture provided through a SIA 2 report and don't just count negative observations because there's a wealth of information in those reports that will tell you so much more about how a ship is managed and operated than just by counting negative observations that were seen on the day. Thank you very much. Um, Duncan, um, there's one question which I'm seeing which is popping up from a lot of people, and that is, when is this going to be rolled out? Um, okay, well, I knew that somebody was going to ask that question and I prepared my response earlier. <laughs> and this is what I'm going to say and nothing else. Ockinf will be making an announcement regarding the transition to SIA 2 over the next few weeks, and I'm not at liberty to comment further on this forum. So sorry about that, but in the end, I have a pay grade and I'm not going to go above it. <laughs> great, great. Thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, Richard, you would like to go? Yeah, so uh, basically, yes, my closing statement, I do uh, echo with what uh, Duncan Shiraz mentioned. Yes, uh, SIA 2.0, I think it's a uh, it's a very positive change which we should look for. 
one good thing is, is tapping it all uh, aspects of vessel operation, be it OCIMF, charters, uh, vessel owners, uh, and, and, and vessel staffs. Uh, so in general, you know, if you look into any organization, uh, performance is based uh, on uh, three things. One is the awareness, uh, you know, the reinforcement, what we create, and uh, last but not the least is the self-motivation. Now, in real world, error traps uh, are there uh, on board the ship. They are <clears throat> predictable. At the same time, they are preventable, uh, only if we recognize them. So uh, if we wish uh, our seafarers, uh, to perform well uh, with no incidents, uh, less number of uh, wetting observations, <clears throat> then as a vessel operator, uh, it is our responsibility to give uh, them a paradigm uh, which resonates with your expectations. Now, what that could be is a, yes, a, a management system uh, which is easy to understand and implement, uh, then an environment uh, which is open, fair, uh, health building trust among crew members on board and uh, at the same time between office and uh, uh, vessel staff. Uh, we need to remember uh, response matters and it matters a lot. Yeah. And uh, lastly, uh, tools and trainings so that, uh, you know, it helps them to recognize uh, error traps and, and, and to correct them. Uh, my closing statement, always remember a bad system will beat a good person every time. So it is very important to have a, a, a good system. Yeah, uh, that's all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachit. Uh, you precisely put down everything together and uh, there's nothing to fear about. Uh, Amit, uh, over to you. Um, so I obviously, I heard all your comments and a very interesting conversation altogether, but I'll give you a little bit of a commercial perspective. Probably it's, uh, if it was calm waters, everything was normal implementation of uh, SAR2 would have been a very easy task. But uh, given our situation, which is recovering from pandemic, three years of shutdown, lockdown, we have seen a very long spell of uh, depressed tanker market. Uh, most owners have not seen good earnings. Everybody's right now focusing on uh, recovering their uh, losses. Uh, then we are focusing again on the Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis, uh, which has no finish line at the moment. Uh, it's going to be a long drawn battle and how it will impact the energy markets. Uh, and then after that, we'll have carbon emissions coming in. So probably if we were in calm waters, obviously the focus could be uh, the, the rollout and the process would have been very expeditious and nice for SAI too. But unfortunately, the, a lot of operators are focusing on the real issues, what they're facing. Uh, which are unforeseen. So the, these these things will take time. Obviously, everybody wants to take a step towards improvement, but uh, we have to be a little bit practical and realistic because ultimately the push will come from stakeholders who are going to, uh, you know, focus on ships which are already ready as for the side to the operators who are ready as for the side to who are willing to take these inspection standards. And then uh, right now, don't forget, most of the ships have been trading in all these remote locations where you can't get the side inspections. They are basically still on remote sides. And there is uh, whatever OCMF may suggest but there is a little bit of a, a discretionary approach towards uh, remote sires. There is a little bit different approach towards uh, load port sire versus the discharge port sire. So these things, we are all basically coming to terms. So probably these are the bigger macro issues what we're facing in the real time commercial market. Huh? And uh, then uh, then probably, yeah, once this th things, these things settle down and we come back to normal uh, terms, then probably, yeah, Things would be a lot easier for the rollout of SAI too. Can, can I just rebut on one point, please? Yeah, yeah, yeah. please. Right. There, there is no difference between a load port inspection and a discharge port inspection. The difference only resides in the, the report recipient's mind, but the, the, the quality of the report will be the same from either. And there are a number, you know, quite a lot of, of the oil majors are quite willing to accept low port inspections. So, you know, we, we are trying to push that forward and say what there is no difference and they have equal value, which will alleviate some of the pressures on trying to get inspectors on board ships. But in the end, it's still a recipient and a submitting company's decision on what that, that is. But OCIV has no view. Thank you. I'll give you a practical answer to that. 
oil majors are the most uh, qualified in basically taking the ships. If you will see the majors such as Exxon or probably Shell, they take ships over 15 years old, right? But there is a very large lobby of, say, probably Asian refiners who generally don't have a vetting system as such per se, like oil majors. And these are the people who basically set these uh, different tiers, uh, whereby a certain sire is less relevant, the other sire is more relevant. Obviously, this is not a vetting expert in their organization who's setting these tiers. It's probably a commercial expert uh, who has probably very little knowledge about the VIQ or the sire 2.0. Uh, although what you were saying, Duncan, I appreciate it, but... Uh, uh, there is certain level of discretion uh, in the market when it comes to the uh, location of the sire, whether it's a load port or discharge port. I'm just uh, sharing this uh, a practical uh, challenge what we face in day to day. Uh, that's that's fair enough. And one last point is the change of mindset is necessary, and it's up to the commercial side to 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 understand what you've just said and go out to that industry and to explain to them that they really, you know, they, they need to be looking at equal inspections, whether they're loading or discharging, because sure. that will simplify the situation for everybody, but it won't change the output from the inspection. They're exactly the same. Thank you. Don't disagree. Yeah, thanks. So that's it. That's all from my side. Thanks, Sanjeev. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Harmit. I think very precisely put down the, uh, the last point, I think, and uh, we that precisely tells that it's not just the seafarers or the operators, but also the commercial operators and other stakeholders also do need more understanding of the system. Let it be the SIRE old regime or existing regimes or SIRE 2.0. Uh, but at the end of the day, actually, we're all talking about that, like, you know, the change is for the good, okay? Uh, at this moment, uh, we, we discuss on many, many uh, things and Possibly I couldn't pick up all the questions, uh, but we'll try to consolidate for as many as possible and try to send you through your emails. Uh, and the million dollar question already been answered by Duncan, which I kept it for the last, <laughs> the new rollout date for OKIM uh, to uh, SIR 2.0. Uh, yeah, we all wait for the OKIM. And uh, finally, on behalf of uh, uh, ICS Hong Kong branch, uh, personally, thanks to all the speakers, uh, Duncan, uh, Captain Suraj, Rachet, Harmeet, Thank you so much for taking part in this web webinar, I think, which is the part of this journey of transport transformation for a safe and better shipping. And we all very positive, actually, because definitely we all can see that things will be better. It's only putting that one into our mindset and pulling down those uh, you know, the different aspects and putting them together to make a nice uh, picture. You know. So uh, we all positive, and I hope that all the listeners in this webinar will also come out uh, with more positive sense that like, you know, come on, leave those things that why it is done now or why this is not there and why this is not there. Let's look forward and take this one and appreciate that thing because eventually someone has pointed out, uh, I think it's, uh, Duncan, you have said that like, you know, it is a journey towards classifying uh, good operators versus a poor operator, which the industry was talking for very long. I think probably this could be a journey where good operators can be simply determined by looking at the report, looking at the, this thing by the commercial uh, operators. So thank you so much again. And I will now hand over to our branch chairman, uh, Mr. Jagdeep Bakar. Over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. And it's been an excellent panel discussion. I think especially for a dry bulk buff like me, it's been a lot of learning for me. Um, I would like to thank again, of course, Sanjeev has thanked, but I would like to officially, as the branch chairman, our esteemed panelist, Captain Sachit Jain, uh, Rachit Jain, sorry, and Captain Harmeet Bhatia, Captain Shiraz Mughal, Duncan Elston. And through Duncan, we would like to convey our special gratitude to Okim for agreeing to be part of this educational webinar. Uh, there are many challenges, as I could hear, as a dry bulk guy, I could, especially the last one with Harmeet talking about the commercial issues and, and so rightly and so very well replied by Duncan. Uh, and Captain Sanjeev Verma, absolutely fantastic. I mean, the way you put it all together, really appreciate. Uh, thank you, Sharad, for the introduction of the webinar. And of course, without the participants and their thought-provoking questions, no panel discussion is successful. On behalf of the Executive Committee of Institute of Chartered Shipbrokers, Hong Kong branch, my sincere thank you to each and every person who joined the 
webinar today. Now, very quickly, let me just update you on our forthcoming events during the Hong Kong Maritime uh, Week, which you know is in, in November from 20th to 26th. On the 23rd November, we have a hybrid event on the maritime corruption need for global action. The event can be attended in person as well as, of course, that is subject to availability. You need to register yourself soon uh, and also online. Plus, it can be watched on the YouTube. Speakers include Captain Rajesh Unni from Synergy. He is the founder of Synergy. Captain Brendan Hawley, who is the board member of MACN. Mr. Deepak Shetty, uh, IRS and retired. And uh, DG Shipping, ex-DG Shipping. Mr. Amod Khare and our own Captain Sanjeev Verma. Another hybrid event we have on the 25th November, followed by cocktail reception. While online is available to everyone, the cocktail reception is for ICS uh, subscription paid members, speakers, sponsors, and invited guests from the industry. Here the speakers include Mr. Benjamin Wong, Ms. Rosita Lau MH, Mr. Martin Fruergard from Pacific Basin, Mr. Bjorn Hodgegaard from Anglo Eastern, Mr. Edward Liu, and Ms. Kristin Lo, who is the chief strategist from HKUST. Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. You may register for the events. Details are available on the LinkedIn, or you can just drop a line uh, to us at chairman at ics.org.hk. Once again, thank you, Captain Sanjeev Verma and Sharad for the initiative and efforts, and our panelists for a great contribution, and of course, the participants for joining us. Thank you so much. We are only 45 minutes over time, but <laughs> I think it's worth it. Still close to 200 people. Uh, they want more, right? So we'll have to wait till 23rd November. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.